morning. Um, sorry, 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 sorry. Thanks for waking up. Coming here. Um, I was told I have two hours. I'm going to utilize every minute of it. Follow this for the rest of the speech. Can you hear me? Do I have to stand here? I feel like. All right. So, um, as a uh, computer scientist, I care more about uh, theory and algorithms of data mining and machine learning. I mean, not more, but I care very much. It is? Oh, wow. This is even worse. Okay. Okay. So, I, you know, we're going to, we, you know, we do a Yahoo, we do a lot of machine learning, a lot of data mining. Uh, and we run them at scale in multiple places. And when you write software, you want to make sure that it works. So I really care about proofs, uh, algorithms as much as I care about the actual data, the application. So this talk is going to be more about ideas, proofs, and algorithms uh, for new kinds of data mining and machine learning algorithms. Uh, and I'm going to try to make the case that we want to try to think about online algorithms more as a community. Okay. So, I'm not even sure which one of them. Okay, so uh, when we think about data mining uh, in general, I mean the standard setting is that we have the world, we take some data from it somehow, we put it on a hard drive, then we crunch it on some machine. Uh, we all know that this doesn't quite work like that anymore. Not sure this thing works. The probabilistic clicker. So, uh, if you want to think about the, the computational model, if I want to think about an algorithm, I would have all of the input uh, accessible to me in memory. I can do whatever I want for it, you know, with it. I can access any part of it, and then I can output my uh, whatever it is that I computed. Now, uh, for several years now, uh, this is unfeasible. So the world actually, I collect data on many different hard drives, uh, many different machines, and then I have to do something with it. Uh, this is, uh, we know this doesn't quite cut it either, so we have to bring the compute power to the data because we can schlep it around. My God. Okay. So uh, now we have a map reduce or a message passing kind of, of computational setting, and here we already don't have the, the situation where we could just access whatever we wanted in memory. When, you know, when we have an algorithm, it runs on one machine and it's completely oblivious of what data exists on other machines. And we can even extend this model to allow those machines to answer queries to which one of those things could be, could have like complex data structures and in real time when you issue a query, you can do something else. So we can make this uh, more and more complex. But I wanna, sh I wanna say that the amount of data that we have right now doesn't allow that. So instead of giving you yet another infographic about how much big data we have, I, sh I wanted to show you how many infographics about big data we have, okay? So we, right now, we can't store all the infographics about big data. Okay, so it's really, you know, I don't need to sell this to this crowd that we can store all the data that we want, okay? Already today, you know, the big companies, I mean, most of the big companies that I know would essentially delete most of the data. They save some data that they can a week back, a month back, three months back, maybe if it's very crucial, but then it just falls off the cliff because, you know, we just collect more data that we can store. So uh, in the streaming model, that is a model that I'm very fond of, it's something that I, uh, a topic that I work on a lot, you assume that the data is uh, aggregated by something that we call a sketch. If you think about, if you don't know anything about streaming algorithms or sketching, think about this as like a Mary Poppins bag for data, okay? You, you put an infinite number of items into a finitely sized data structure Unlike Mary Poppins' bag, it's not magical. You know, it's glossy, but it's 
uh, it's locked in a very precise and accountable way so that you know that when the data, when you have finished aggregating the data, what you have in the sketch is a faithful representation of the entire data set, okay? Now this is not, you know, even this model evolved to have a, uh, okay, so let me just kind of say what uh, the computational model is here. And the computational model is, you get essentially instead of getting the data, you get an iterator for the data. You can just ask for the next data point, okay? And your algorithm is limited to have some idle fixed amount of, of memory or some poly logarithmic amount of memory for the length of the stream, okay? Uh, and by the end of it, you have to res you know, either produce the result or produce the string, or both. So there is yet another complication of this model. You can now say, I, don't, I can't even consume the data on even the stream of infinite items, I can't even consume on one machine, so now think about I have like many front-end machines serving like search, right? I see a bunch of search queries on each one of them. By the end of the day, I wanna know something about all the searches I ever saw in the system in the last 10 years, okay? That's a massive undertaking. What you can do is create one sketch on each one of those machi machines and then combine them. And then that's a different set of algorithms that allow you to actually take, it's another requirement on those summaries that are, that are actually mergeable, okay? So this is a very useful thing. Again, I worked on it for many years, I still, I still do. It's excellent for doing analytics, it's excellent for doing uh, all sorts of uh, 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 monitoring, um, and it's in general very good to do some sorts of machine learnings, and, and uh, Yahoo re released a, an open source uh, version of Mergeable Sketches uh, library that I'm, I'm very uh, happy to contribute to on a regular basis, so check it out if you if you are interested. But I want to I want to say that this is that the topic of, of this talk is to say that this is fantastic, but not always enough. Okay, and the uh, the idea is that regardless of how efficient you are in collecting data and being able to say at the end of the day, like what all your data looks like in a very efficient way, sometimes you can't wait till the end of the day. Okay, you have to act immediately. And that, you know, if you're writing a spam classifier for emails, then you see one email at a time and then you immediately have to decide whether it's spam or not. And then, and then you go forward, okay? Now this creates, uh, this creates a conceptual difficulty that has nothing to do with big data, okay? It just has to do with the nature of not knowing the future that makes, you, makes it hard to make decisions today. If I see an email from, I don't know, some, some sender that I've never seen before, I have no idea if that's spam or not. But if I see 10,000 emails from the same guy in the next two seconds, well, I know much more, okay? So there, there, is, there is the computational difficulty and there is the information theoretic conceptual difficulty of just how to even design algorithms that operate without knowing the future, okay? And these things are very common and they, you know, essentially a, a ton of machine learning and, and, and data science that we do is, uh, in fact, in that model, even though we don't necessarily think about it. So when you do stock prediction, you compute today based on everything you know in the past, you make a decision for allocating different assets, and then you're done. You place your, you know, your assignments, and then you wait for tomorrow. You only know tomorrow what happens, and then, again, you don't know the future. Okay, so before that, we just, had to output yes, no, or spam, not spam. Here we have to output like a whole vector of allocation. Uh, this is also true for ads. Again, you, you, a user comes in, uh, we have an, uh, an opportunity, we have to make a decision right away. We don't know the future, we can't take advantage of you know, having seen quote unquote all the data. Um, and this is also, uh, you know, so, uh, I know how many of you use uh, uh, Yahoo's front page and news feeds and so on, but stories are collapsed so that if you have 30 different stories on the debate between uh, Hillary and Bernie, then we don't show you 30 different stories, right? So now, think about a campaign trail. You deciding what is one story and what are different stories is very difficult. Like they kind of mash together, right? So if you wanna if you wanna do this, you have to uh, 
you have to cluster them correctly. But then when a story comes in, you don't know if 50 other stories in the same vein are going to come in the next two days. You kind of have to make a decision on it. So, uh, okay, one, one last motivation. Uh, we do machine learning online all the time, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to talk about online machine learning. This is a very well studied uh, sub-discipline or sub-field of machine learning. Uh, but it's very well known that both dimensionality reduction and clustering are extremely important feature engineering tools for online, for machine learning in general. So now if you do online learning, you also have to have the, the feature engineering happen online. Okay, because otherwise it doesn't, you know, it kind of defeats the whole purpose. <coughs> and we have in clear indications that both k-means and uh, PCA and other things are extremely good feature engineering tools for decision trees in your classic classes. Okay? So there's ample motivation. In some sense, I want to challenge you all to think about your problems and say, think about whether those are actually streaming or online or what's, what's the situation that you're facing with your, with your application. Okay? So how am I on time? Oh, beautiful. Okay. So, um, so let's think about let's think about the computational model we're facing. Okay, so now we're back to computer science. This was motivation. Uh, back to computer science. We see an input. One, it doesn't matter. It's a sample. We may <coughs> we're allowed to make some computation. And then we have to output an action that could be a cluster ID or a spam no spam vote or something like that. And then we see the second input, and we have to make a decision, a third, and so on. Okay. Um, and so just to make this, thank you. So let me make this more concrete with an example, okay? So the ski rental problem is a very famous online problem. It's probably one of the most basic ones. But it's, it's beautiful in explaining exactly why, why online problems are difficult and why it has op almost absolutely nothing to do with the amount of data. Okay? So let's say you want to go skiing. You want to pick up skiing. You've never skied before. And uh, you want to decide whether you want to rent skis or, or buy them. Uh, let's say like buying skis costs 1000 bucks and renting costs like some different amount every day. Okay. So you go for the first time, you go for the first time, it costs 70 bucks to rent. Uh, you figure out, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rent this time, just pay 70 bucks. And then uh, you go for the second time, you pay 90, still decide to rent. And then on the third day, you say, okay, I really like this thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep at it. Uh, I'm going to buy skis. You pay, you pay the 1,000 bucks. You, all in all, uh, ended up uh, spending uh, 1,160 bucks. Then, unfortunately, the next time you go, of course you pay nothing because you already have skis. I mean, you pay for that, but skip it. Uh, but whatever, you twist your ankle and you say, okay, this is not for me, uh, and you stop, you quit. Okay? So you end up having spent 1160 bucks, whereas you could have just uh, rented the entire four times and only spent like 310. So now, just just not knowing that you were gonna twist your ankle cost you 700 bucks, roughly. Okay. So uh, so now, how do you how do you make this decision in a in a in an algorithmic correct way? So one one basic solution is to say I'll just rent gear until I have already spent a thousand bucks on renting, and then I will buy it. Now what happens, so what happens if you, uh, if you rent, if you stop before, let's say the, let's say the, the first like renting, like let's say roughly a hundred bucks each and like 10, you have to go 10 times to get to the buy. So if, 
if you ended up going less than 10 times, which you wouldn't have been able to know when you started, then you did exactly the right thing. You just ran this, okay? If you go 11 or more times, then the right thing would be to having bought the gear from the gecko, okay? Of course, you didn't know that. So what you ended up you ended up at the 11th time paying $2,000. But the optimal, and, and you never pay anything again later, right? And the optimal thing, having known the future, would have originally bought the gear for a thousand and stayed with that, okay? So you're a factor two away from the best possible solution, regardless of how many times you go. You can say that a factor of two is not great, but for this problem, you can't do any better. I mean, you can do slightly better, you get a one plus one over E or something. Get, you know, like a constant factor there. But just not knowing, you're gonna be the moral of the story is skiing is expensive. All right, so um, let's switch gears. I wanna, I wanna tell you a little bit about uh, mainly like two problems, uh, PCA and K-means, two very, very basic uh, data mining tools that will probably uh, go all the way back to the beginning of the previous century. Um, uh, where we had some pretty uh, good solutions in the batch setting, we even had some pretty good sensible, solu sensible solutions in the scalable setting, and we have Sergey who's gonna tell us more about it later, my friend and colleague gave a speech in the, I think the first uh, talk after the break on K-means. Uh, but let's start with, P let's start with P PCA, and we'll start with the one-dimensional analog of PCA, which is just linear regression. I think all of you should probably use that. So in linear regression, I just have a bunch of points on let's say the plane, and I want to pass a line through them that minimizes the sum of square distances from the points to the pro their projection on the line, okay? That's a pretty easy task. Uh, like, essentially you have to like take a derivative and equate it to zero and you get the linear equation and just No idea what this oh. Okay, so in the, think about this problem in the online setting. Okay, in the online setting, you get one point, and I tell you what is the regress to value for that point. So think about I'll, I'll go from two dimensions to one. You get a two dimensional vector, just x, y, and you have to return like one value. Okay, that's the that's the that's the uh, the point on the right on the on the one dimension. Okay. Now I give you another point and say, okay, what is the regress to value for that point, and so on. So um, you can already see this becomes a much more unruly problem. First of all, your distances. So if you're done, so when 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 you're done, you want to measure how good you were compared to the best possible. So essentially you take this line on the right and you try to rotate it in space such that it's closest to its original points and then you measure the square distances. And you, that's what you get penalized for. Okay. But now those distances are not projections, those are arbitrary distances, or arbitrary directions in space based on what you have done in the past. Okay. And this becomes, you can try to do the, the calculation for it, it just ends up being like a very weird thing okay, and kind of hard to reason about. Okay, that's, you, can, you can pretty much convince yourself this is the simplest possible thing you can try to do online. Okay, questions about this? Okay, so um, principal component analysis of this, who has, who doesn't, who knows what PCA is? All right, good. So let's skip the rest of the slide. Uh, I think about PCA as really a, a high dimensional analog of regression. Okay, I just have a bunch of points now that are in high dimension. Here are three, but you know, the limitation of uh, drawing. Okay, and I need to find a, 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 a subspace of dimension K space. And then what I get penalized for is 
the sum of square distances from the Poincaré high dimension project projected on the low dimensional plane. So here's like the high dimension is three and the low dimension is two. But of course, in data, the high dimension is usually like a million and the low dimension is like 100. Okay? And this is, you can see how this is exactly the same thing as regression. If the, the dimension is two and you project the dimension one, that gives you the linear regression. Okay? So, uh, there was a pretty, very, pretty recent result from uh, late last year that uh, we finally managed to get PCA to work online. And this is the algorithm. I hope you understand it. Uh, I don't, actually. Uh, I'm not expecting you to read this. I just want to show you that the, the pseudocode is very short, so it's not like a crazy algorithm. Okay? So if, if you import your favorite linear algebra package, that would be probably like, 20 lines of Python, like 5,000 lines of C or something. All right, so here is, here is the example that I wanna, uh, so this is, a cons this is a, an actual experiment that I ran with that algorithm, but I wanna try to walk you through what you're seeing here. So uh, I took the title of our paper, I, I took it as a matrix of, of like grayscale, so every column of that matrix is a vector, okay? So you, sh you really shouldn't think about this as letters, but really as a matrix, okay? Uh, and the top line is just the actual matrix. The, the line in the middle is what you, what you get if you PCA that ma matrix and you do the regression. So I, 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 did the, I, I took the high dimensional vectors, which are the columns of the original image. I projected them down to dimension 20, I think. Don't catch me, it might be 50, I'm not sure. But some 10 times a small integral. Uh, and then, uh, and that's what you see in the middle. So this is like offline batch PCA, the thing that we used to and, and love it. Okay? Uh, now the bottom one is what happens when you run online PCA from left to right. So you see the first vector, you don't know anything about the matrix and you have to immediately decide where to, you know, where to project it to, okay? So on the left hand side, you know nothing. You really know nothing. So the best thing you can do is just project things to their average. So at least you preserve the energy. But that's it, okay? Uh, and for a while, uh, you do that. In some point, you figure out, oh, I have these like short vertical lines, right? And you say, oh, I wanna, you know, some like, like the skis, right? I've, I've paid enough for those directions in space or for those kinds of vectors, I wanna buy them. So you commit to that direction in space, and you add it to your arsenal of possible projections. And you keep, and you keep doing that, and after a while, if I can, yeah, wait, can you see the pointer? I try to walk through it. Um, so you, you, keep, you, you keep increasing the complexity of your model, you keep committing to more and more directions, and you'll see roughly two thirds into the matrix, you have pretty much recovered the right singular space for that matrix, and the rest of it kind of looks like the offline PC. Okay, and that's that's conceptually what we want from one-line algorithms. They start knowing nothing, and then they kind of converge to something good on the go. Okay. Questions about this before I uh, move to clustering? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I can't, I can't qu quite quantify it. I mean, I, 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 I was tempted to put the lemma here, but I didn't know if I would lose you like very early on the day. Uh, but the, I, let's say this. I can guarantee, okay, that if you do online PCA to dimensions slightly larger than K, say K over epsilon square, then it's only one plus epsilon worse than the offline setting. Okay? Kind of a, so it's a bi-criteria setting. And always in, it's like in the ski rental thing, knowing the future helps you, you can't beat that. The question is how much more, uh, you know, how much leeway do you give yourself and how much worse off you are? In some sense, you have to lose on both fronts, which is frustrating for everyone, but unfortunately impossible to beat. So you get 
the project is slightly fewer, slightly more direction in space, and you pay a little bit more, but in a very controllable way. Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. I didn't think about it, but it, it could be. I mean, I didn't think about it, but you could just like scale them up. You can trick the algorithm by just making newer vectors like with higher norms. But I'm not sure it would do exactly what you want. I'll be happy to think about it. It's a good question. I Yeah, um, that's another very good question. I mean, I think if you do, so there are results, there is a separate set of results that talks about what happens when the vectors that you see come from an unknown distribution. Essentially like machine learning, right? You have some distribution over vectors and you, and you get like data from there. It's like adapted to the linear algebra setting. Right? Let's get a matrix whose columns are IID from some unknown distribution. Okay, what can you do then? Okay, and then you can do better things. You get better results. Um, or at least in theory, you get better results. Okay, but of course, you have to make a very heavy assumption. So if, if you can actually adopt those algorithms to take advantage of your assumption, saying, "Yeah, the distribution changes, of course, probably not very violently, because otherwise, you probably couldn't do anything." But but if it's you know, slow enough, you can probably do something extreme to fit the two grain descent, descent anyway, because provably okay. But you have to go through like matrix computation and stuff. It's not the usual. I don't know. I mean, I, it's a good question. I think as a uh, as a theoretician, I'm trying to solve the simplest possible things that I can, and the most basic possible problem that I can think of. So I have to clean it from all the possible assumptions on data and stuff like that. Uh, but I think after we know the basic solution, we can now crank up the dial again and try to make it complex. Uh, and ha knowing something about the nature of the matrix might be a very good place to start. So, but, so the the real answer is I don't know. I, mean, I haven't uh, tried to do any of this. But potentially you can do something. Again, if you know something about the specific nature of the matrix, I think you can do something. Uh, but the d domain, quote unquote, that we talk about is linear algebra. I mean, so the same way that skiing, is, you know, you paper renting and buy, you know, the currency is money. Here, the currency is square to loss, like aggression. That's kind of the. All right. I have like ten more minutes. I want to just move on to clustering. Okay, so, oh, just uh, this, this slide shows that if you do online PCA for feature engineering, it's kind of like doing offline PCA and then offline learning. So you kind of like translate. You can skip that. Okay, so K-means, uh, this is also a pretty recent, oh, it was rec recently published, but we actually knew this for about two years now. Um, in k-means, or in most clustering in general, actually, you have a set of points here in some Euclidean space, but not necessarily in general. Um, 
you put them in clusters, uh, and uh, what you pay at the end of the day. Okay, so it sh it, you can uh, endow every center with, with the cluster with a center, and then what you pay is the sum of square distances from each point to its own center. Okay, it's, it, conceptually it's not unlike regression or PCA in that sense. You, you have a subspace of a, a restricted set of points in space to which you pay the square distance. Before that it was a subspace, it is a set of K points. But some, something to think about. Okay, so I don't want to, I don't need to sell you the idea that clustering is important, okay? Uh, so I'm not going to do that, but uh, but it's uh, but let me try to tell you that, that clustering online is actually very very important. I'll tell you. I'll give you the example about news again. Okay, when I when I get a new news story, I have to make a decision immediately. Do I do I put it on a pile of stories like in a thread of, of stories that already exist, or do I start up a new storyline? Okay. Now this is immediately visible to you know tens or hundreds of millions of people. You can't keep switching on them. So if you do something, you commit to it, okay? The question is, how do I measure my success in hindsight, okay? And my success in hindsight, um, sorry, I want to measure my success in hindsight as the, as what would have been the best decision I would have made had I known everything in advance, okay? Had I seen that, you know, the first story about the Bernie uh, uh, Hillary debate was actually going to be followed by 500 other ones, so I want to start a new story. It's not just yet another storyline in the whole campaign, okay? Um, so this, uh, again, this, I'm just showing you the pseudocode. Uh, this is, uh, these are more lines of pseudocode, but you don't have to import any library. So. Theoretically, it's fewer. Uh, so again, we have this setting where we have to project to, we have to create slightly, you know, we have to create more clusters than K, and we have to, we have to incur a cost of more than what opt would have done, the optimal solution would have done. The same thing as before. Uh, and again, this is unavoidable. Surprisingly enough, or maybe not surprisingly enough, this online algorithm that I just showed you and didn't talk about at all how it works, um, works, uh, produces results or produces a square to error that is uh, comparable to k means plus plus. If you don't know what that is, you can read Sergey's fantastic paper about it. Um, it's an adaptive sampling technique that lets you get provably close to the optimal solution for k-means in a very efficient way. It does operate in a batch setting, okay, but again, very efficient batch setting. Uh, and that, that's this, that is something that we decided to uh, take as a benchmark. Okay, so the x-axis is how k-means plus plus uh, does compared to a random uh, seeding. Take, take any random subset of k-points from the data, okay? So you'll see that on the far upper right hand side, you have some data sets that are essentially unclusterable. Okay, uh, the best possible clustering and a random set of points kind of do the same. They have a ratio of one. Those are not exactly interesting data sets to cluster, and those exist. The closer you, you know, the the more to the left and to the bottom of the plot you go, the better clusterable the data is. Okay. On the right, on the y-axis you have the ratio of what an, the online algorithm does compared to a random seeding. So the random seeding just normalizes both axes so I can put a lot of data sets on the same plot, otherwise they will just be all over the place. And you can see that uh, when, so the, 
the image is skewed. It should have been a rectangle, and the slope would have been one. So, um, you know, when the look at the orange data set, uh, and you know, if you expect a K means plus plus to get a ratio of roughly 0.3, then you should expect the same thing to happen with online, roughly point. Okay. So I'm not advocating the online algorithm to be ran as a, the best possible batch setting algorithm. There are possibly better things we can do. But nonetheless, if you operate in that very constrained setting that you have to make decisions on the go, it's very good to know that you can be competitive with an offline algorithm uh, nonetheless. So this is uh, just the last slide saying that if you, if you use this k-means, to create features for your online learning, you actually do pretty much as well as you would have done with offline feature engineering and offline. Learning. Essentially, uh, an analog slide to the PK slide from before that I skipped, and I'm gonna skip this one too because I'm out of time. Uh, and the just take home message is that if you uh, do any kind of sequential decision making or model fitting on big data, and you, you have to make actions, uh, you probably want to think about uh, the intersection of the streaming and the online algorithm. So you want to both take decisions online and be best with respect to the, to having known, best in comparison to what would have happened had you known the future in advance. And you of course want to be streaming because you want to be efficient memory wise. You don't want to ship around the entire data from the beginning of history. And uh, that's essentially it. Thank you.